Tension burst in Abuja today, my people. Come and see how everywhere was scattered as some members of Islamic groups attacked police officers early today in Abuja. My people, this is a serious issue going on right now. But before we dive into it, let me welcome you back to Laju Park TV show. So if this is the first time you're watching us or you're just joining us on this episode, please do me a favor, like, comment, and share this video on all social media platforms. And also don't forget to click on the notification icon so you get acquainted of our next video. We've got a lot to unpack, so stay with us. We'll be back short. Andre Nereko! Yes, Aratapu! Welcome to the Life of Fimi here. The Hold of Crime Scene. It's happening in the street again! The center of political news, celebrity gossip, religious gossip, and happiness in the society. Join us, the voice of Africa. All right, my people, let's talk about the drama unfolding in Nigeria. My people, how can we be facing such severe economic hardship and yet some group just rise from nowhere to disrupt the peace of the nation, adding fall to an already burning situation? It's like we are constantly shifting our focus from the real issues to something entirely different. Why do we do this to ourselves in Nigeria? Just when you think you've seen it all, something new just pop up. Imagine today, August 25, 2024, a violent clash broke out between the police and members of the proscribed Islamic movement of Nigeria, IMN, also known as SHIT, in the Wuse area of Abuja. This wasn't just a small outer creation. Oh no, it started at a police checkpoint at Wuse Junction, and before anyone could say jack, it escalated into chaos. Two police officers lost their lives and three others were injured in the process. My people, can you imagine? These attackers didn't come to play. They reportedly used machetes, knives and even improvised explosive devices. To make matters worse, they set three police patrol vehicles on fire. As if the situation wasn't bad enough, the chaos didn't stop there. It stretched all the way from Baga roundabout to the Wuse market area, turning the district into a tension zone. The police had to really struggle to gain control of the area and they've made several arrests in connection with the attack. The FCT police command has already condemned the incident and assured the public that investigations on are ongoing. But my people, this is not something we can just brush off. But hey, I don't want to bore you with too much talk. Let me show you the video clip of what's going on in Abuja right now so you can see it with your own eyes. Stay tuned. Welcome back my people, honestly I'm baffled by what is happening in the country. At a time when we should be coming together to face our challenges, we are out there disrupting the peace of the nation over things that don't even matter. Are we really thinking straight at this crucial moment? How can we, in the name of religion, suddenly become a terrorist? It's like we've lost our sense of priority. Think about it my people, there are countless atrocities happening in this country every day. Our economy is in shambles, people are suffering, corruption is at hand all time high and insecurity is everywhere but instead of focusing on these present issues we are channeling our energy into something that only brings more harm it's like we are deliberately ignoring the real problem when are we going to open our eyes to the reality we are living in maybe we don't fully understand the damage religion has caused us in this country we keep letting it divide us letting it dictate our actions to the point where we forget our common humanity we are so caught up in this religion differences that we are tearing our own country apart this is a wake-up call my people it's time we realize that these actions are only dragging us 
further into chaos. Religion should be a force for unity and peace, not violence and division. But until we truly grab this, we'll keep falling into the same trap. To give you a clearer picture of just how bad this religion station has became, I've prepared a clip for you to see. It's a stark reminder of the dangers we are facing if we continue down this path. Let's watch the video and we'll be back shortly. So quite aside from what I've said I'm going to be talking about this week, which is the role of religion in the Nigerian mess, we'll still talk about that, but we'll start talking about that on the dot of it. But there is something I said earlier in the week that a lot of people asked questions and I did promise that I'll talk about it before service today. This is our own Sunday service now, since we won't go to church. Or some of you will still go, or some of you have already gone. So what do I want to talk about? I said every victim of Nigeria is a Biafran. And a lot of people are asking, what does that mean and all of that? So I'll explain. You see, the thing with Nigeria is that, I've said repeatedly, we are a people without citizenship. So in the absence of citizenship, we've all become tribesmen. So rights are located in Nigeria based on the capacity of your ethnic group to project power. So we talk about the Fulanis being at the apex. That is the way the typical Nigerian view this. We conveniently forget that in actual fact, the frontline victims of the Nigerian state is a Fulani peasantry because they are the actual beginning and foundation for the feudal, the feudal state that is evolving. So when a person is consistently victimized and disadvantaged by the Nigerian state, it is legitimate to actually say that the person is a Biafran because the Biafran is actually the archetype of the Nigerian victim. I would explain, don't worry, now calm down, calm down. We are talking to ourselves. Look at it this way. A civil war ended, and everybody were told, no victor, no vanquished. But that was a lie. And you all know it. It was a blatant lie. Now, I'm not looking to paint Ndigbo like the victim they sometimes like to paint themselves. Because to a very large extent, Ndigbo has been complicit in the evils that have been perpetrated against Ndigbo. A lot of Indigo politicians built their powers and wealth on the back of grievance politics, but they never really sought to advance the lot of the people themselves. They just used the noise to legitimize their own demands for seats at the table of impunity that governs Nigeria. So for a long time, everything that could be deployed okay so you talk about educationally disadvantaged states i assure you that the persons who bought the brunt of those kind of policies educationally disadvantaged state uh, quota systems all the systems that were kept in, that were put in place in the governance of nigeria as it moved away from the regions and increasingly became a feudal state that pretends to even be a unitary system all those systems of evil, of marginalization, they were first proven against the Igbo. And when that was happening, the old of all, or the old of lot of us, Yorubas, the people who call themselves the Middle Belt today, all of us, we were happy because there was enough to go around. As a lot, we were happy to go along with these marginalizations institutionalizations of these dual multiple citizenship systems. So when I speak of the Igbo, the Igbo people, as being the archetype of the disadvantaged Nigeria, is not me talking about them as a group. I am talking about everybody whom, against whom Nigeria has perpetrated one injustice or the other whether that be a Nuri man, a Fulani man, a Nupe man, a Yoruba man, and a German, you are being treated like that because none of us are citizens. We are tribesmen. And in the order of tribal persecution, those are the ones at the lowest rung of the ladder 
until recently when the victimization now went around the war and it has now emerged more as a class thing than as a tribal or ethnic construct. But like I said, that was the aside. It's now eight o'clock. Welcome to each and every one of you who is joining us now. I usually have that part where probably I use it to settle myself into this subject. And I think I might want to go back to this intro about the Nigerian and the Biafran question in another sermon on another day because it's provoked quite a bit of thought and I realize that I have not had enough time to deal with the substance of the issues that I have raised. But if you are interested, and um, for, th for those of you who were not with us from the beginning, that was at five, um, 7.55, you might want to take a look on my YouTube channel later on to familiarize yourself with that. But this morning, I'm more interested in speaking to a subject that has become particularly relevant in recent days, but one that I have dealt with at some depth and to some extent in my book, The Imperatives of the Nigerian Revolution. I believe you will find that at page 263. I actually delayed the publication of the book because I realized the centrality of religion to the place where we are today as a people. So at the time the book was to come out, I delayed it so that I might write that section. So it might be of interest to you. You can download the book free from my website, dailyfarotimi.com. Uh, the book is there for free. Uh, if, you are in, if you are looking to enrich me, you can go to Amazon and go and buy it. There are a few bookshops in Nigeria that sells it, but more importantly, you need to read. Because there is very little that I'm going to say to you today that I did not put in that book. But there is this wicked thing that racists are want to say. They will say that if you really want to hide knowledge from a black man, you should put it in a book. I don't want to hide knowledge from you, so I'm compelled to speak to you or speak with you as I'm attempting to simply because I know that even though this book has been available for free for two years now, very few of you have bothered to avail yourself of the opportunity to feed your brain. So let's talk, since you won't read. So what is the role of religion in the Nigerian mess? Is Nigeria in a mess? I think that would be a good place to start from. But I also think that that would largely be a rhetorical question because the one thing almost all of us appear to be agreed on is the fact that our country is in a mess. We're in a place that would be frightening to anyone who is still managing to retain the use of their brain. We should be worried and we should really, really be worried if we're people capable of contemplation, introspection, and visioning. Because we are indeed in a very deep mess. But with every mess comes multiple opportunities. And opportunities can only be found on knowledge. And this is one of the reasons why I have decided to take it upon myself. I will as much as time allows, deal with different subjects from Sundays to Sundays. Don't worry, I'm not competing with any churches and I'm not asking for any offerings. So we can actually at least establish as a fact that Nigeria is indeed in a mess on multiple fronts. But in our mess, there are opportunities, as I have said. What is the role of religion in the Nigerian mess? The role, of the role of religion in the Nigerian mess is foundational. It is deep. It is central to the very existence of the contraption known as Nigeria. 
Without religion, there probably wouldn't even be a Nigeria. Because Nigeria is essentially the product of British greed. And British greed was essentially anchored on the back of its economic interests, packaged in religious and pious terms. But for us to have a clear understanding of where I'm going with this, I would have to offer you a bit of contextual basis. I was born a Christian. My paternal grandmother was a prophetess in the Kerugum and Seraphim Church. I was raised a Christian. I remain a Christian but I am not a religionist. I was having a chat with my wife like a week ago, and I remember saying to her, and I think to another friend that, I thank God for the abundance of my carnality, because in the absence of that, I might have ended up behind the pulpit, and you will be robbed of the opportunity to listen to the bad man that you are listening to today. So, Religion is um, something that we're all born with. The spirituality that religion should guide us to is something that we would all have to evolve. Religion comes from the Latin word, religare. And there is old French. Is it that old French is a religio? One is religio, the other is religare. But the one that is religare, I believe that's old Latin. It speaks to binding. It, it, it actually speaks to fettering the imagination of man. Because, you know, the Bible says, quoted unquote, now, the art of man is desperately evil. Some say it's wicked. So what religion tries to do is to provide structures, systems, within which man could live a disciplined life that makes him, renders him amenable to control within a society. If you manage to find God in the mix, it means that you begin to evolve a religion and you begin to evolve a relationship with God. So we must quickly distinguish religion and spirituality. Crazy as it might sound to some of you, I am deeply, deeply, I don't know, I won't say spiritual, but I have a relationship with my God. And I do not deprecate anyone's attempts at building relationships with God through religion but you must understand very quickly that religion must be distinguished from spirituality so how does this relate to nigeria i'm merely offering you context so that you would understand that i'm not anti any religion be that christianity or islam but there is a generalized nature to the guilt related to religiosity and practically everything that is wrong with us as a people. Because whilst we profess God in our private spaces, whilst you find churches and mosques proliferating all over the place, there is very little of God in our space, as evidenced by the eminent putrefaction of our society. So, how has religion been foundational to our mess? It goes into our history, and I'll go a bit back. Long before Christianity found its way to our shores, Islam was here. Islam was the foundation for the construction of two empires. These empires straddles what is today 
generally referred to as Northern Nigeria and extends well beyond the borders of what we call Nigeria today. There was first the Kanembono Empire. This you'll find in today's Borono part of Yube. That is the Kanuri based empire, and it was an Islamic one. The second was the Danfodio Caliphate, the Sokoto Caliphate. It emerged from its own ruination of the Abe dynasty, the Ausa kings. These two Islamic empires coexisted not necessarily on friendly terms, but they coexisted on the basis of a clear understanding fostered after the Kanemish letter to the Caliph, making clear that as a fellow Islamic empire, they were due the courtesies extended in Islamic theology and jurisprudence to every other Islamic kingdom. So the two managed to find some detente and coexisted side by side. But those who you today know as Christians in northern Nigeria were largely people who had to fight to make sure that they were not enslaved, or those whom both sides either deliberately left unconquered to be used as slave stocks in the trans-Saharan slave trade, which preceded any transatlantic slave trade. So let's be clear. Before the British came, parts of what you call northern Nigeria today, such as the Plateau, southern Borono, parts of Kebi, vast parts of the Middle Belt, most part of what we had blightly referred to as northern Nigeria were people who either were able to withstand Fulani conquest or Kanuri conquest and managed to stave off destruction before the British came with colonization. So for those people who either embraced Christianity, in fact, they largely embraced Christianity in protest against those who had either enslaved them or assailed them before the coming of the British. So for the people in that part of Nigeria, religion is a matter of identity. It is not a matter of faith. Let me be clear. Religion is a matter of identity. It's a function of deviance, of a people saying, we survived your generational assault on us. It was an act of deviance. They embraced Christianity. They didn't do so with the British happy with what was happening. But you will find several reports of frictions between the missionaries and the colonialists. Multiple reports. And you'll find multiple examples of protests by the northern Muslim emperors, emirs and sultan, Shehu, complaining about the actions of the missionaries amongst those they had come to regard as their stock. So let's be clear. Brutal fact religion in northern Nigeria, be that Islam or Christianity, was always a function of identity. When the British came and these lines were being drawn, 
There was a wise man in northern Nigeria, Sir Amadou Bello, very wise man. He crafted a policy of one north. He understood clearly the identity politics that religion was capable of foisting on northern Nigeria. So he proclaimed that northern Nigeria was one. And he tried as much as possible to avoid pandering to Islamist sentiments. I wrote at length in the book about how he resisted the origins of Gumi's father's demand. He, re he resisted that, the, that demand that Sharia should be imposed in northern Nigeria. He resisted it. And he instead brought the Pina Code in northern Nigeria as a compromise position. So religion has always been central to the politics. I'll let you learn the basis of the Middle Belt Revolt on your own. But suffice to say that religion is central. When you come to the southern part of Nigeria, where the British found people who were largely... There was Islam, in, before I forget, there was already Islam in southern Nigeria, brought by Mayan traders, and they were already established in places like Lagos, long before any Fulani or Kanuri crossed over into Yoruba land. Islam had entered Yoruba land through the Malian traders. So it wasn't, it's not a function of um, any jihad introducing Islam to Yoruba land. That is why you have the one in the war claiming that he's the Sultan. Of, so I'll leave you to learn that history on your own. But it's important to understand that Islam was already here. But Islam found a people who are largely cosmopolitan in their views of life generally. The Yorubas have never been constrained until very recently by overt religiosity. There is a level of liberalism that you will find in religions in, like, in Yoruba land, when in the same home, you find the, the syncretism is almost amazing. Somebody is both a Muslim and uh, a consultant, a con uh, yeah, he consults with Babalawus and will gladly visit a white government Babalawu as well. So generally in southern Nigeria, particularly amongst the Yorubas, we've always had a pretty much open mind about religion. So you find very quickly that in Yoruba land, until the coming of partisan politics in the 50s, religion wasn't really a thing. But even then, it was restricted to a very narrow part the silver of Yoruba land that was largely around the Ede Iwo axis because of the deep penetration of Islam in that part and the recourse to um, Islam as a mobilization tool. It wasn't even a, it wasn't an Islamization. There was nothing about it that sought to convert anybody, but it was a matter of identity for certain people and a way to rally the people generally found in that Ede, Ikirun, um, Iwo, that, that's where you still find the bulk of Islamic scholars within the western part of Nigeria. And then the Akoko Axis. But anyway, for, for, what, for all his work, Islam was a tool of mobilization for some people. And then Chivaulowo and AG found ways to appease these emergent tendencies and they found very quickly that because of the nationalist outlook, and I'm talking about the Yoruba nationalist outlook of the action group, um, you find very quickly that a lot of religionist resistance fizzled out.
because nobody was looking to marginalize anybody. So there was sufficient room for everybody. So to a very large extent, anyone seeking to use religion as a tool of political mobilization in Yoruba land largely fell flat. Not that it didn't try, it was always there. There was always the Irish call, there were the Irish callers of the world. Everybody still recognized the potentials of the mosque as political rallying grounds. But I believe it was the overt pressure of the Christians in Yoruba land that eventually all right all right my people as you can see we need to dive into what's really happening here because this situation is more than just a random event it. it's a reflection of deeper issues that we are not addressing as a nation now let's ask ourselves why are we here why is it that in the midst of several economic hardship and some group choose to create even more chaos instead of focusing on the solutions the attack by members of the islamic movement of nigeria isn't just a stand alone incident is a symptom of a bigger problem one that we've been ignoring for far too long we are at a point in nigeria where our priorities are all over the place the economic is in shambles insecurity is rampant and corruption is draining the life of the country yet instead of coming together to address these present issues we are tearing ourselves apart over religious differences it's like we've lost sight of what truly matters think about it two police officers lost their lives today and others were injured life has been shattered families left in mourning all because of clash that didn't need to happen and what was the result more violence more fear more division is this really the path we want to continue the truth is we've allowed religions to become a tool for division in this country instead of being a source of peace and unity it's been twisted into something that causes harm this isn't just about the IM MN or the police is about all of us as Nigerians we need to take our step back and ask ourselves why we keep falling into these traps why do we allow our differences to blind us to share our humanity we are at a crucial moment in our history if we don't change course now we are only going to see more of this incident more loss of life more destruction but it doesn't have to be this way we can choose a different path one where we focus on what unites us and not what divides us i want to challenge everyone watching this let's stop letting religion or any other differences tear us apart let's focus on the real issues facing our country and economy and our security our future because if we keep ignoring this we keep letting ourselves be distracted by violence and division we are only going to make things worse and even this will serve as a tool for the politicians who are corrupt ones to continue to use us as a slave this isn't just about what happened today in abuja it's about the future of nigeria let's make sure we are building a future that's based on unity peace and progress not one that turns apart by violence and hatred it's time to wake up my people it's time to do better so thank you very much my people this is where i'll be putting on on this episode so if you're watching us for the very first time kindly like comment and share this video across all social media platforms and also don't forget to click the notification icon to get YouTube recommendations. Nice.